Hello, good evening, and welcome to our Storyteller's Secrets workshop stream here at Elysium, a weekend of darkness. I'm Jason Carl. I'm the brand marketing manager for World of Darkness. I'm the host and storyteller of LA by Night. And of course, I'm a big fan of Vampire the Masquerade. And I'm a big fan of you too, the family. Thank you very much for being with us today. You could have been anywhere this evening, but you're here with us and we're grateful for that. Thank you also to Renegade Game Studios for inviting me here to share this time with you and to discuss something that's near and dear to my heart and I hope to yours too. And that's storytelling for Vampire the Masquerade. And whether you're an experienced vampire storyteller or just getting started, I hope that something in this discussion sparks some ideas and inspiration for you. Every storyteller in Vampire the Masquerade has their own style, their own preferences, and their own way of approaching vampire. And that's a good thing. I'm going to share with you some of my own approaches and hope that they're interesting and helpful to you. Now, a couple of notes before we get started. First of all, I can't see you. I can't see the chat. So uh, unfortunately, I'm not able to read your questions and comments in real time. But fortunately, our uh, intrepid producer, Chris, can. And since this is a workshop at several points during our discussion, uh, I'm going to pause and ask for your input. And Chris is going to very helpfully read some of your questions and comments and relay them to us so that uh, we can have uh, a dialogue. Someone asked earlier today, will Jason share all his storytelling secrets tonight? No, there are too many LA by night cast members watching for me to do that. But if you watch LA by night, you know already that secrets have a way of getting out. So I will share some of them with you this evening starting right now. Let's begin with the most important storyteller secret, the ultimate secret, and that's communication. Why? Because it's one of the biggest challenges of being a storyteller and one of the hardest things to handle at the table or, or the virtual table, that, that uh, Roll20 demonstration that uh, Trivia and Diana gave for us uh, a few minutes ago was amazing. Uh, I can't wait to experiment with that, try it out. Um, especially when the game is happening, communication can be difficult when the action is flowing and uh, emotions between the characters are running high. Sometimes communicating clearly what we need, want, and expect can be difficult. And so. We're going to talk about four topics tonight that each connect back to this theme of communication. We're going to talk about session zero, opportunities for action, secrets and consequences, and give players what they want, sort of. So without further ado, let's begin with storyteller secret number one, the session zero. Now, if you are new to Vampire the Masquerade, either a player or a storyteller, you may not be familiar with session zero. If you're an experienced player or storyteller, you may be very familiar with it. I'm going to run through how I approach session zero and give you some uh, guidance, I think, that might help, uh, even if you've done it before. Uh, time is precious, and opportunities to enjoy experiences like Vampire the Masquerade together are also precious. So it's challenging enough to schedule a game with a group of busy people. And it can be tempting to jump right into a chronicle and start playing when the opportunity presents itself. Because when do these opportunities happen again? But maybe you've done that. And maybe something like this has happened to you. You discover you have time to run a game of Vampire the Masquerade and so do your friends. Players create their characters. They maybe ask you a few questions about clans or powers or how a specific rule works. How does Oblivion five dots work anyway? And then everyone arrives at the table with their character sheets and their dice. You, the storyteller, arrive with uh, maybe uh, an outline or uh, maybe a, uh, a great chronicle source book like uh, Chicago by Night, excited and ready to play. 
but without any discussion. No talking about what you all want from the experience and what you all expect. And then a few hours later, maybe things aren't so good. And you start wondering, ah, is, it, is it too late to start over? You know, what happened? Uh, why, you know, why aren't we having uh, as much fun in this chronicle as we thought we might be? Often when that happens, it's because of communication. And I think that session zero is one of the best storyteller tools available to um, work through communication problems early, especially when communication problems come from conflicting expectations. So what is session zero if you're not familiar with it? Session zero is the very first time that you and your players sit down together and talk about what the game will be. Um, it's the opportunity before anybody creates a character, maybe before they even read a book, you never know. It's the opportunity to talk about what kind of story you want to tell together, how you want to approach it, what everybody wants to get out of the experience and what style of play. One player at the table might want to play a story of being new to the night, a fledgling embrace who experiences the world of vampire for the very first time, getting caught up in the, uh, the wonder and the, the dark majesty and the, the, the fear of the personal and political horror of vampire. Another player may uh, be interested in a morality play in which um, difficult questions of uh, moral weight and ethics are the top consideration. Another player at your table might prefer a political thriller uh, or uh, maybe action adventure with a lot of combat and gunplay and uh, dangerous situations on the gritty streets. Still another might uh, prefer to explore the possibilities of love beyond death or even just the general strangeness that the world of darkness uh, can bring. Discussing what everybody wants before play begins, before even characters are created, is a great way to ensure that everybody's expectations are clear and that um, everyone can discuss how they want to approach it. And it's okay if every player at the table wants something very different. That just means that players and the storyteller, you, will um, be collaborating a lot more than you might in a, uh, in a more traditional role-playing game situation. The session zero is also the perfect opportunity to talk about considerate play and consent and safety. Now, this is before, again, uh, before the game even begins. Um, talking about consent and safety at the table and what safety tools you're going to have in place to make sure that when difficult situations arise, everyone knows what to expect and how they'll be handled respectfully together. Now, at my table, I prefer a mix of lines and veils and some sort of X card. And these are tools that I find help ensure that um, uh, the story content that you and your players are creating together has clear boundaries right up front. It's also important to talk about a way that you're going to pause the game and communicate out of character to make sure that everybody is still having fun, especially when things are, are getting tense. Um, groups that work together to uh, talk about considerate play and how to handle these situations generally have a better time and find the story is easier to create together uh, and it's easier to keep the action flowing uh, at the table. In some session zeros, the players actually create their characters together, right there in front of each other without keeping any secrets about what's on their sheets. Now that might seem strange, but it can be a benefit to telling great stories together. If everyone knows uh, what's on each other's character sheet, sometimes that facilitates play and encourages people to take risks with the drama that they might not otherwise take if they don't know what's on those character sheets. Now that's not a requirement, it's just an approach that some storytellers prefer to take. Session zero is also where you as the storyteller get involved with creating the characters. It's where you talk about the connections between them. I think we all saw that uh, wonderful relationship map in uh, Roll20 that Trivia showed, uh, showed us a little while ago. Creating that map together during Session Zero makes for uh, more opportunities for very dramatic, satisfying play. Uh, if you 
talk about which character hates whom or which character wants to undermine another or which character is in, in love with another character. This creates chances to bring that drama t- out during the play session. And it comes out a lot faster and um, a lot more excitingly than if those pieces of information are kept secret from each other. This is a chance to talk about touchstones, what mortals are important to each other characters and who knows about them. It's a chance to build convictions and chronicle tenets together and to talk about your characters' ambitions and desires, maybe even their backgrounds, and also to build the the Coterie's Haven, if that's something that they share. And every piece of information that the players share together can facilitate that exciting play that I talked about. And I'll I'll discuss a little bit more later uh, about how this all can come together uh, in the moment at the table. Uh, I think this is a good place to pause and ask our, uh, our producer friend, Chris, to ask the chat if anybody has any questions about session zero, how to handle it, when to do it, how to resolve problems that come up, or even any suggestions that you might have for session zero techniques that have worked for you. All right, Jason, I love, I love session zero. Um, you know, it is the best, isn't it? You know, it's something I didn't, I didn't learn about until just last year. And uh, mm. it, it really improved my gameplay because y- you know where the boundaries are. So it makes things a lot easier to handle and you know mm-hmm. what to avoid and you give people the freedom to say, I'm not comfortable. It's, it's fabulous. And, you know, you mentioned a couple. I can't of imagine running another story without a session zero. Right. Um, what are some tools that you might uh, think are invaluable? You mentioned the X card is one. What are some other great, like somebody who's just starting out and just kind of experimenting with these tools? What are some great resources or tool that you might want to point them to? Mm, the uh, the best tool I'm going to point you to is uh, in the Vampire the Masquerade Core Rulebook. And it's a chapter, well, really an appendix, a whole appendix devoted to considerate play. And uh, what we mean by considerate play is that... Um, it's okay for characters to be uncomfortable. It's okay for characters to be terrified. It's okay for characters to be upset, but it's not okay to deliberately provoke those emotions in players. Everybody has um, topics or situations or areas that they prefer not to introduce at their role-playing table, and that's okay. In fact, I think it's, um, it's vital that the players talk about that together. When we did session zero for uh, L.A. by night, we all uh, took turns talking about what are the lines that we as players uh, prefer not to cross? What are the topics that we prefer not to have introduced at the table? And where are the veils? Where will we fade to black to imply action but not state it explicitly? And talking through those situations as players and as storyteller together, I think enhanced our experience um, dramatically. Later on, when we when we talk about some specific information, I'm going to speak about a few other techniques. But uh, one I want to talk about is the check-in. And uh, I want to uh, I want even though it's not strictly part of session zero, session zero is a great place to talk about the check-in. And it's exactly like what it sounds. It's stopping play or pausing play and asking, is everything all right? Uh, Especially if the storyteller notices a player um, uh, reacting with intense emotion to a scene, it's okay to pause things and say, is this all right for you? Is the intensity appropriate? Should we intensify the action? Should we decelerate the action? Should we switch to a new scene? And um, I find that um, some players find this surprising because they think, well, doesn't that ruin the experience? On the contrary, I think it improves the experience and enhances it. When players feel safe at the table, when they feel that they can express uh, their preferences and their um, uh, their lines and their boundaries um, freely, without that, it makes the experience better for everybody. And um, I haven't ever been in this situation where it detracted one iota uh, from the group enjoyment at the table. Um, the X card is another great one that we talked about, and that's what it sounds. Uh, a player can hold up a, a specific card with an 
you know, um, and um, that means change the scene or decelerate the action or switch things out or I'm uncomfortable. It means whatever the group has decided it means during zero, which is why it's so vitally important to have that conversation, ideally before even a single dot is filled in on the character sheet. Um, I think that uh, there is uh, experience that they find it they find it a bit revelatory, revelatory for the first time, and they find that um, it's not just something that's uh, great for vampire. It's great for all role-playing game experiences. That was probably a longer answer than anybody wanted. That was great. Um, I think it's important to, you know, really explain these things, especially for a lot of people. It might be a very new integration into the system, especially for new players getting into Vampire, which has a lot of heavy themes that you deal with and, you know, has has a lot uh, of opportunity for people to feel uncomfortable. Absolutely. Vampire, I like to say, um, is a, you know, very moral game about very immoral creatures. And some of those tensions between morality and immorality, between humanity and the beast, between peace and violence can create for very intense situations at the table, especially because vampires often find themselves thrust into situations where they must choose and yet no choices are good or no choices right. are convenient. Um, and when you're faced with those devil's choices, those devil's bargains sometimes, um, it can really help to know what everybody's boundaries are and where the right path to respectful play is. Again, I can't imagine running a, any role-playing game without a session zero and without discussing consent and safety tools first. Yeah. Um, another good question um, came up and it was from Cuban Turin. He asked, uh, what are some ideas for running a session zero async or via text if you're, that's the way you're getting your game on right now? Mm -hmm. um, we live in a charmed time, right? We have you know partners like Renegade bringing uh, Vampire Roll Twenty with us. We have uh, access to tools like Discord and um, other um, piece and text and other asynchronous communication methods. And um, Vampire the Masquerade and other role playing games don't necessarily have to be played around a physical table. And thank goodness, right? Because after you know what the world has endured for the last eighteen months or so, and in some parts of the world is still enduring. The, uh, the enjoyment and the friendship and the camaraderie of role-playing games you know, really helped people uh, cope with these difficult times. So it's a great question. Um, it gets a little trickier sometimes, of course, because uh, if it's asynchronous, you don't always get the benefit of having everyone discussing in real time. Uh, what I found to be very helpful in those cases is um, having everyone take turns consolidating the information and then if everyone's comfortable the storyteller sharing the information out on a shared document like a google doc maybe uh or in a, a group text so that everyone can be advised uh, of what others have said it isn't easy it's extra effort but i think it's safe to say it's worth taking the effort to cons to uh, assemble all those um those opinions and ideas and sharing them together i hope that's helpful Oh, I, I find it helpful, so I'm pretty sure they did too. So um, I think we have another good one that's on Session Zero. Mm. There's a lot of people chiming in too, uh, a lot of positive okay. remarks about people who've integrated right. into their play and have really found Wonderful. success with it. So I think that that's awesome. Uh, this one is, so how do you manage a situation where um, you're the, let's see, the way they say it specifically is how would you manage a situation where the expectations of one player conflict with the ones of another player? Mm -hmm. It's It happens frequently. Uh, I think more, more frequently than not. Everyone comes to the table with different expectations, different desires. They want different things from the experience. And sometimes those expectations and needs and desires clash. Um, I have never been in a situation where the problem wasn't solved by, what are we talking about tonight? communication. Um, and I think there's sometimes a reluctance to address those clashes at the table, particularly if the table who aren't involved, but 
I think that despite those risks and despite the, the possibility uh, of that happening, not addressing it has much higher consequences, uh, both in the short term and the long term. In some instances, I've had to take players aside and sit down together and say, look, we have a disagreement. The, you, uh, as I understand it, you, know, you want uh, Z, and uh, as I understand it, you want Q. How do we reconcile this together? How do we create a situation where everybody gets at least some of what they want and we enjoy it? And I find that involving the players in the solution generally produces better results than if the storyteller is forced to arbitrate um, unilaterally. Um, that's always possible, of course, if players, you know, prefer not to compromise, but it hasn't been my experience that that happens too often. There is always the very rare edge case where um, players have um, clashing agendas for their characters or for their enjoyment, and it's just not reconcilable. In those very rare instances, that's unfortunate, but it does happen. And sometimes people are happier in a different game. Not every game and not every table is for every player. And I think it's very important for players to find the experience that works best for them. And it isn't always going to be universal. Awesome. Awesome. So, All right. uh, yeah, I think now a lot of the questions are starting to get into where we're we're headed next. So I'm just gonna, are we headed? Oh, okay. I, I, I think see. we have a direction, right? Right. Is, it, is anybody asked zero. what I'm drinking tonight yet? Uh, if I wasn't working, if I wasn't working. <laughs> it's uh, I, I I hate to tell you, uh, it's vitamin water. Sorry. Oh, I'm, that's sad. That's sad. But all right, so gotta get your vitamins somehow. Yeah, yeah. Yes. This okay. So, first. well, I, it's, it sounds like a great place to transition into our next topic, our next storyteller secret. And that uh, is something I like to call opportunities for action. The World of Darkness uh, brand team, uh, which I'm a part of, um, talks about this a lot. We discuss this often, weekly, sometimes daily together, opportunities for action. Uh, what does that mean, especially in terms of a storyteller running a, a vampire game? I don't think of the storyteller as the person who's in charge of the game experience. Uh, if you've seen LA by night, you may understand what I mean. Now, I might be standing behind the storyteller screen, but it's the players who make the decisions for their characters based on situations that um, I offer to them, that I describe uh, to them. Uh, an opportunity for action is an invitation from the storyteller to the player to make a choice. Something happens. What would you like to do now? That's an opportunity for action. Something doesn't happen that you expected. What would you like to do now? Traditional tabletop RPGs um, often place the storyteller in the role of a kind of director. And sometimes that might feel like that it's the storyteller's job to entertain the players. And that usually involves the storyteller presenting a narrative and the players reacting to it. One of the secrets of storytelling for Vampire that I found most useful is that trying to aim for an emerging story is often a more exciting way to go. And this means not putting the players into the role of passengers in a vehicle that the storyteller is driving. It's a collaborative effort, uh, a shared creation of story uh, in real time. And in these situations, the storyteller is less of an omnipotent director and more of a collaborator at the table, just like the players, but with different responsibilities um, than the players have. And the best opportunities for actions that I've found in Vampire especially are around conflict. Conflict drives opportunities and every conflict that the storyteller presents is an invitation for a player character to take an action. And conflict can uh, be created at the macro level of the Chronicle. And by that, I mean um, the starting conflict situation of your Chronicle could be something that affects every character 
uh, in the story. Maybe the characters have something that storyteller characters, NPCs, as they're sometimes called, want. And that tension between the characters having it and someone else wanting to take it away is uh, an immediate call to action. Someone tries to take the thing that you have. What will you do? How will you address that conflict? Will you um, will you draw your weapons and, and come in with guns blazing and swords flashing? Or will you take a longer view and set up a scenario in which you win uh, more indirectly? Sometimes um, it's the characters, though, that want something that someone else has. And that's a conflict, too. Uh, maybe the characters have a really, um, really unappealing territory. You know, maybe the feeding isn't so great in, in this part of the city. The, the blood isn't plentiful. Uh, maybe it's not to their taste. Maybe there is um, just uh, not the kind of resources that they want to uh, utilize and they'd like a better territory. Well, that character over there has better territory. Maybe the characters want to take it. And that conflict between wanting something but having to take it away from someone else is another opportunity for action that sets up a whole cascading series of invitations to act. Uh, other, uh, other conflicts might involve uh, being tasked with uh, an imperative. The, the coterie is uh, paid a visit by the sheriff or the scourge. Ooh, that doesn't sound very good, does it? And uh, they're given um, a command, hey, do this thing and we'll be grateful or don't do this thing and we won't be grateful. Uh, the characters have an opportunity to take an action and it can work on the micro level as well. And uh, what I mean by that is that those ambitions and desires that the characters uh, have on their sheets that the players created together uh, in session zero are all invitations to act. Um, when a player character desires something or has an ambition to fulfill, uh, the storyteller can um, use that uh, to take uh, to take the opportunity uh, to offer an invitation. Uh, let's take a, a concrete example. Maybe one of the player characters has uh, you know the ambition to become uh, never happened, right? Uh, that character wants something that either is or unavailable, and that ambition offers uh, many opportunities for action uh, on the part of the storyteller. And the, the storyteller can set up situations uh, that are invitations to the player character to take steps on that journey. Um, it doesn't always work out the way the player character wants, of course. And um, opportunities come with obstacles and difficult choices. But remember session zero, if the storyteller understands the player characters before the chronicle even starts, they can start taking steps to integrate those characters into the story. That character who wants to be Baron, well, how is he going to get there? Is the Barony vacant or is it held by someone else? Either decision creates different opportunities for action. Maybe another character at the table uh, you know, has the ambition of finding their sire. They don't know who their sire is and it's a quest a personal ambition, uh, a driving need to understand where they came from and why they're here. That also sets up opportunities that you can. Uh, the players don't always take those opportunities. They don't accept every invitation and that's okay. Um, none of these are dead ends. They can always be saved to come up later. And opportunities for action that are refused can have consequences in and of themselves. And we'll talk about that in the next section, section which is uh, secrets and consequences. I find too that um, listening to the players as their characters talk to one another and as the players talk uh, will yield opportunities for action as well. The players and the characters say things to each other that inspire uh, more opportunities at the table. Maybe the characters are talking about that vacant barony and they're discussing how they're going to go about uh, taking it. One character wants to go in uh, and take it by force, so, you know, eliminate the opposition and simply declare that they are the baron of, the, of this uh, of valley or uh, you know, some other part of the town and daring opponents to try to take it away from them. 
there is a, there, there there's an entire chronicle right there that uh, every uh every storyteller's dream is to have a, a character with motivations that clear but maybe another character at the table prefers a more subtle method they want to finesse their way into the into the barony they want to set up a um uh, a political situation in which uh, the vampire who owns the barony is disgraced and forced to give it up, or maybe even has to hand it over voluntarily through a series of favors and, uh, and boons. All of those create opportunities uh, for action, and those opportunities happen. Arrow involves creating those characters together. Remember that relationship chart we talked about and the, the great relationship chart that um, uh, the trivia showed us? Each of those connections on that relationship chart represents a potential opportunity for action. When characters dislike each other, the storyteller can choose that relationship and create situations that require uh, characters to make choices. Characters that love each other, characters that want things that other people have or who feel beholden to one another, all of that's an, uh, an invitation to take an action. Uh, the difficulty here, of course, is that during play, when the game is happening, it can be difficult sometimes to come up with these uh, opportunities on the fly. Uh, improvisation isn't easy. And uh, sometimes um, characters you know, don't want what is offered. I'm going to talk a little bit about how we, we resolve that in, uh, in, you know what, never mind. I'm going to bump that up right now. We're, we've just changed the, uh, the order of operations here. Uh, Here's some specific advice for what happens when no opportunity seems to be working or when the invitations that you're presenting just don't seem to be in line with what the players have in mind uh, for their characters. What I do in that case is before the game begins, uh, I, prepare, uh, I prepare secret lists. Uh, here's a deep storyteller secret that very few people know about me. I don't have a good short-term memory. In fact, I have a terrible short-term memory. Um, I remember some you know, books I've written years ago, but you know, I don't remember what I had for breakfast this morning. So I prepare for these problems. I prepare cheat sheets for myself before each game that, present, that uh, list different opportunities for action. And I base these opportunities on that relationship map that we talked about. And I base them on what the characters put on their sheets in session zero, their ambitions their desires, their convictions, what they believe in, their touchstones. And all the opportunities that I write on my list, I try to make them flexible enough that I can just drop in anywhere if all the other invitations just aren't working. Oh, the character has a, a, a touchstone that's having a, you know, difficulty at their, at their job or their workplace. Well, jeopardizing that touchstone sometimes creates an opportunity for action that the, that the player character will accept and that will create drama and excitement in and of itself or maybe the character has a conviction that hasn't been tested in a while uh, there's an opportunity to invite the player to make a choice that involves that belief about the line that they have told themselves that they will not cross but what happens when they're tempted to cross it and i find that by preparing for that eventuality uh, I'm usually able to come up with situations on the fly when I need to that um, create excitement um, if there isn't any occurring organically and naturally at the table. And I create lists for everything. Uh, to digress a little bit, uh, one of the secrets that I like to share is that I create lists of uh, character names that I can drop in um, because sometimes I have a difficulty inventing them on the fly. I create lists of interesting locations in the city that I become aware of. I keep a little notebook with this information. And, oh, there's a yacht club in the city. I didn't know that. That would be a cool, cool place for a clandestine meeting. Or, wow, that bridge over there is just begging for a, for a uh, secret meeting uh, of uh, rival factions uh, who are out for each other's destruction. Uh, and I find that preparing in advance just a little bit, just a few pieces of information, help me create those invitations on the fly when I need them. Okay, opportunities for action. I'm gonna invite the chat to take an opportunity here. And the action I'm looking for is, what kind of questions do you have about using this secret, this technique uh, at your tables? Um, what would be helpful to you in this area? 
Oof. Well, uh oh. Well, they're they're getting that together. We have a bunch of uh, <laughs> yeah. You have a bunch of stuff on the action. Uh, the Fire away. Very popular topic. Um, so in, in many ways, opportunity for action, I think, is is one of the really important pillars of vampire storytelling. If if the storyteller does nothing else at the table, making those offers, those choices for action is the one thing that needs to occur in order for everybody to have a chance at a good time. So one thing that came up multiple times uh, as Uh-oh. a driver for action um, mm-hmm. was was actually you um, about how you invite players into the action by voicing the beast as hunger or increasing their hunger mm. throughout. So Vampire the Masquerade um, has this great system, of course, that um, the players already know about the, the hunger, the hunger dice and the, the hunger system. Um, and uh, our, our uh, brand team uh, colleague, uh, Kareem Muammar, uh, in, uh, came up with this uh, and we tested it to destruction for a long time before we, we settled on the, the final form uh, that it takes today. But it's a, it's a brilliant idea, I think, and it works so well. The idea of the beast having different personalities is not part of canonical lore. You don't find it in any book. It's something that I've always done uh, in vampire storytelling. Almost, I think, since I started, you know, many, many centuries ago. And it always seemed natural to me that each vampire would feel the beast differently. It isn't necessarily um, an audio cue. It doesn't necessarily speak in their minds the way I sometimes do it. It's the way I choose to in this story. But the the urge of the beast, the, the terrible things that the beast wants, is a constant invitation to action. Whenever hunger creeps up above, you know, one or two dice, the beast starts to want things to happen beast has appetites that it wants to be fed and um, I find that reminding players of that often uh, creates um, you know excitement and drama at the table that you you wouldn't have thought of otherwise and sometimes it can make even the simplest uh, horribly horribly wrong and that's a lot of fun for everybody especially me right uh, I love it because it it really is the plus one character at the table. You know, it, it is the ultimate In protagonist that everybody's mm-hmm. having to work mm-hmm. with, right? And every vampire experience is right. This is a universal experience that every vampire, every kindred in the world of darkness feels these terrible appetites, these, these, these terrible uh, urges. Um, and they must be satisfied because the consequences of not satisfying them are even worse. And that, um, you know, the, uh, the core adage, the core philosophy of vampire, a beast I am, lest a beast I become, I think is um, arguably the, the quintessential opportunity. When in doubt, I say to you, storytellers, the beast is your friend, and so is the hunger. Excellent. And, it's not your, uh, it's not the friend of the characters. Though. Yeah, and you know, I I know we want to we want to keep a move on because we we got you know the night oh, we're, coming next. We're, we're, yeah, we do, we do, we do. I'm excited for that. Yeah. Um, keep 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 me honest here. I'm very excited for the nightlife. Miami yeah. is Miami is such a vampire city. All yeah. those those bright lights, those the that colorful South Beach atmosphere, the you know the the joie de vivre and. The, um, just the sheer vitality of it, hiding that sinister layer of vampire activity. Oh, what a what yeah. a great! Job. I think Diana's choice was there. Inspired. I can't wait to see it tonight. And you know, there there are a lot of uh, I see a lot of Spanish speaking people in the audience. I see mm. a lot of Latin American flags on a lot of the groups. So I, I'm excited to kind of see something that might be a little closer to home for a lot of people, right? Uh, we're we're very fortunate. The the family in uh, in Latin America is uh, is huge. It's both huge in terms of its you know size, but it's also huge in terms of its passion. We're super fortunate to have um, uh, that community uh, involved in our in our stories and our games. Hola, <laughs> excellent. Um, so I'm going to kind of put a bunch of them together. Uh, Tiger E three asked a great question. Uh, and so many other people kind of chiming in. And it really has to do with 
how much do you like to script ahead? Uh, and you know, what do you do when it goes off the rails? Because how much do I like to to what ahead? Script ahead. Script like how much do you oh. want to script and outline the scenarios and the plot lines? Then how much do you want to kind of make up on the fly when you know? Because nobody ever kicks down the door that you expect them to kick down, right? No, no, no storyline ever survives first contact with the players, right? No, you can. You, I, I've found my experience has been that um, you can plan as carefully as you want. You can try to plan for every possible contingency. <laughs> It doesn't work. Um, I think uh, I think um, for uh, for our chat viewers who watch LA by Night, you'll they'll probably be able to think of several instances where just reading my face, you could tell. Well, this has gone completely off the rails, and now this is an entirely different chronicle than I thought we were going to tell. And I love those moments; they are fantastic. Um, I love it when players uh, surprise me and don't do what I expected them to do, but it is difficult sometimes to handle that in the moment. And, um, uh, I can't claim this is an original thought and, and, uh, I wish I could tell you exactly where I first, um, came across this formula. I don't, it's, it's been a long time. Um, and I've modified it over the years, but my, my best advice to storytellers who find that themselves in that situation, um, is first and foremost, narrate the situation. Take a look at what's going on on the table. If you didn't prepare for this, that's okay. It's even okay to tell the players, I didn't expect you to do this. I wasn't ready for this. We're going to collaborate and build this scene together. Let's see you know, what we can make of it. I think, I think that honesty like that at the table between storytellers and players um, can lead to amazing experiences together. When everybody knows that this isn't expected and that the outcome is uncertain, that gets pretty exciting. Um, I ask leading questions in that moment. How does your character feel about this situation? What are you trying to achieve? How does your character feel about this other person in the scene or this other kindred in the scene? How does your character's conviction run up against what you just did or what your coterie mate just did? Asking those leading questions can help you figure out how you're going to narrate this. And by narrating the situation, I mean it at its most basic level. Describe what's happening. Try to make it as, as uh, realistic and vivid as possible, but don't overdwell on the details. Just give the players enough information that they can make choices. Give them opportunities for action. And then, once you're done narrating and the players have made choices, adjudicate. Um, if what they've chosen isn't in the rules, that's okay. The rules system is very flexible, you know. Pick an attribute, pick a skill, make a role if that's what you want to do. If the outcome you know isn't really all that important to the overall story, hand wave it. Just say you succeed or you don't succeed or um, uh, try a different way or maybe get some help. And then after narration and adjudication, transition to the next scene. Not everything has to be played out in minute detail to its mathematical conclusion. It's okay to, um, you know, to skip ahead and say, okay, we didn't expect this scene to happen. I'm going to narrate for you what you see, what you hear. Here it is. What do you want to do? Adjudicate it, pick some rules and go, and then wrap the scene up. Okay, that scene's over. Now we're going to transition uh, to the next scene. Another thing you can do when that happens is use the three turns and out option. I really appreciate that one. Vampire is very much a narrative first game. And um, sometimes just deciding, well, this unexpected situation has no easy resolution. So we're going to play three turns of whatever it is, three turns of combat or, or social standoff or um, you know, frenzy against fire. And then I'm going to narrate the conclusion at the end of three turns. And... Um, Sometimes that's the best way to move the story ahead when the unexpected happens. I find that play, I find that trying to anticipate every possible action usually leads to less drama at the table rather than more. Now, I say that having admitted that I have a bad short-term memory, so I do tend to prep details a little bit in advance, but I never try to write the story. That's not what I'm interested in at the table. I'm playing to see what happens, just like the players are. None of us know. I know where each night begins. 
I have no idea where it's going to end. And I find that uh, incredibly fun and satisfying. I hope that's helpful. Awesome. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of people were, were chiming in that they actually like it when things kind of go off the mark. That's when, you know, storytelling is fun. I think that's some of the best moments and some of the best, most memorable moments. Um, there was a situation uh, in a particular situation uh, in L.A. by night where uh, the player characters chose some some uh, uh, particular actions. I looked at my notes. I thought about it for maybe 20 seconds and I uh, I realized, well, this is an entirely different story. <laughs> the entire season that I thought was going to happen is now something else. And it was fantastic. And I did exactly what I've just described. I narrated the situation. Here's what's seen. Here's the choices. Here's the invitation to action. I adjudicated. And then we transitioned. Once it was done, once it had reached a satisfying narrative conclusion, we moved the scene on. And from that moment, from that incident, uh, an entirely new season, uh, entirely new series of, of stories appeared. Uh, I find it I find it refreshing when players thwart my expectations. Yes, and and there's always that one who who takes extra special glee in doing exactly that. So, oh, some of them live for it, and I think that's great. I think every storyteller should be grateful for those players. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so why don't we continue on? Uh, I think we covered mm-hmm. that one nicely, and we still have a little. Great. We still want to drop some more knowledge, so. All right, so let's move on. Secret number three, appropriately named Secrets and Consequences. Many of the members of the family have heard me say before that the world of darkness is a place of secrets and consequences. And I like to think of the role of the storyteller as the person at the table whose responsibility is to interpret these secrets and consequences for the players, creating those opportunities for action. The world of darkness itself wants things. I mean, it wants terrible things. And um, in my role as storyteller, I'm there to um, interpret and present those terrible desires and turn them into uh, chances for drama. Those opportunities for actions that we talked about, each and every one of them can expose a secret, a little one or a big one, and each of them can lead to a consequence. I think for Vampire, that gets um, really exciting when those secrets and consequences involve the storyteller characters that populate the Chronicle, the other kindred, the ghouls, the mortals, um, ghosts, the restless dead, the hunters, Second Inquisition. And who knows what else might be looking in the shadows, maybe the Sabbat. All those entities want things. We talked about that. It's good to want these things. And um, I try to tie that into secrets and consequences that I then link back to opportunities for action. Um, What do I mean about that? My experience has been that the most important thing for me to know when I sit down to run a game of Vampire, when I get behind that screen, is what the player characters want, those ambitions and desires, and what the storyteller characters want. This is where those secrets and consequences originate from. I look at all the different storyteller characters that populate the Chronicle. The primogen, the princes, the uh, the Nosferatu in the sewers, the the mortals who you know run the uh, the convenience store where the player characters like to hang out, and I ask myself, what do they want? Sometimes it's as simple as they just want a good night's sleep for once, and sometimes it's as grandiose as you know they want to uh, start a million dollar entrepreneurial company. Uh, what are they willing to do to get what they want? What lines will they cross? What risks will they take? Who will they throw under the metaphorical bus in order to get there? And what won't they do? Where are their convictions? Um, where do they draw the line uh, on, on sacrifices that they're willing to make to get what they want? What happens if they do get what they want? What happens if they don't? What happens if it's the player characters that are the kindred who are preventing them 
from getting what they want or who helped them get it. Did getting something for one of these storyteller characters irritate yet another storyteller character? All these questions I try to answer for myself before I sit down and have them ready, generally written down, but sometimes there's no time and you just have to do your best with, with whatever memory that you have. And I find that um, answering those questions um, generates secrets and consequences. I know what they want and I know what they're willing to do to get it. And I try to use those as well to create opportunities for action. Let's, um, uh, you know, let's pick a, actually, let's ask the chat. Let's pause for a moment. And uh, what's something a player, uh, a storyteller character might want? Let's try to workshop it a little bit together. Let's turn it into a, an opportunity for action. You can pick two or three if you like, but. It's, it's funny because there's actually a comment um, that, uh, somebody made that I enjoyed. He's like, chat's actually been a little quiet and he likes it because it reminds him of a dinner table with a food so good that they just shut up and chew. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to choose to interpret that as a compliment. <laughs> Thank I, you. I, so I, I'm a chef by trade. I totally take that as a compliment. So absolutely. Um, well, fortunately, I'm full of opinions. So, <clears throat> so we have a bunch here. Uh, a lot of good mm. ones rolling right. in here. Um, <clears throat> Pardon me. So let's see, blood, freedom, love, the right to embrace, um, to become a prince, uh, to increase their fame. Oh, these are great wants and desires. Uh, revenge. Um, ooh, love Haven. and revenge, two of the best, right? I, I think this is stuff. great. We're seeing, uh, we're seeing, the, you know, the story practice. Right, in some ways, you know, what we're seeing here is the range of wants and desires that storyteller characters um, that have, and these can apply to, as I said, nearly any storyteller character. Um, you know, let's um, uh, let's pick one good one for vampire creatures that are well, they aren't strictly speaking immortal as we might understand the word, but they are undead and they can live, who knows how long. And during the accumulation of those those decades and even centuries, they can find themselves in situations that demand redress. They want vengeance. They want um, what they feel is personal justice for wrongs done to them or to somebody else. And revenge can be um, a very powerful driving emotion. And from that desire, you can start to build secrets and consequences. Why do they want revenge? Well, somebody did something to them. What did they do? Somebody murdered someone that they cared about. Was it an accident or was it intentional? Well, the storyteller character doesn't know and doesn't care. That's not the point. So, okay, they've got this secret. They're harboring a desire for revenge out of a sense of justice. So we know something about them. Now, um, what happens if that storyteller character presents an opportunity for, act, for action to the player character. Help me get revenge. Maybe it says, maybe it's that direct. Somebody did something terrible to me. I will offer you a boon. I will help you get something that you want if you'll help me exact vengeance. So do this for me, but don't tell anybody else. I've shared my Siku. Let's see what happens. And now, of course, that's where the consequences begin. Maybe the player characters decide um, not to do this. How does the storyteller character react when they realize that their offer has been rebuffed? Does that set off a, a new chain of consequences? Do they, do they then want revenge on the player characters for the slight? Uh, characters carry out the storyteller character's wishes and they, they find the perpetrator. And that can be a whole series of adventures with new secrets and consequences. And they carry out the vengeance, whatever it may happen to be. Perhaps it's just humiliation. Maybe it's um, stealing something. Maybe it's the final death. That's going to have consequences too, because chances are really good that that story killer character whom they've just acted on um, probably had secrets of their own and wants and desires. And now those come into play. And from that one simple invitation to action, uh, from the from that secret comes the consequences. 
you can build an entire chronicle uh, based on this. Let's pick a different one. Love, right? Love is love beyond death is one of the absolutely classic vampire the masquerade uh, stories. And when love is desired, uh, I think there are few on what uh, what one is willing to do or uh, to risk to obtain it. Um, if the storyteller character is in love with uh, a player character, and um, you know that's an invitation to a romance storyline, but um, you know maybe they're maybe they're in love with their mortal touchstone, and out that secret could be used as leverage. It could be used to spark uh, an entire different plot line. Um, feeding territory. That's one of my favorites because when uh, when vampire raised. Um, they often find themselves at the bottom of the uh, hierarchical structure of whatever faction they've aligned themselves with. And the desire to um, get a better territory is fundamental to survival. Um, all vampires need good access to what? To blood. And they need a place to hunt. They need a place to sleep safely to protect themselves from the, from the light of the sun. And the desire to expand their territory um, uh, creates great opportunities for action. But the same is true for storyteller characters. Maybe the characters have a great feeding territory and somebody else wants it. Maybe their territory hides a secret that the storyteller character wants to obtain, but doesn't want anybody to know that they want it. What's the consequence for uh, letting that happen? If the characters find out and they stop the incursion, that's a different set of consequences. Um, I'm not suggesting that storytellers will want to make a branching decision tree, uh, but it can be helpful. Sometimes when uh, I have a moment and uh, I know that a, an invitation to action is coming up that's based on a, a storyteller character's secret desires or secret wants, I will sketch out a quick tree uh, and I'll, I'll write yes or no. Under yes, here's what happens if they get it. Here's what happens if they don't get it. And I find that very simple spark creativity um, at the table. It doesn't need to be paragraphs of, of written information. In fact, I find that at the table, there's no time to, to read all those carefully written uh, paragraphs that I prepared, the pages of backstory, the, the deep descriptions. Uh, there's no opportunity. It would slow down play to the point where I think it would be not fun for, for my players. So I try just to write bullet points or quick notes that um, will jog that, that poor uh, short-term memory. Um, and, uh, spark those at the table. Remember those lists I mentioned? Um, you know, uh, I mentioned that, uh, one of my techniques is, um, to create lists of, uh, important care goals, interesting locations in the city opportunities. And, um, those two, uh, can substitute as secrets and consequences. If you're stalled, if the action doesn't seem to be going um, in a way that's making anybody at the table satisfied, and you sense a, you know, you read the room and you sense a change in the tension, I look at my lists. Oh, remember that location, that yacht club? Well, something's going to happen there. There's now a secret associated with the yacht club. Maybe there's a, uh, maybe there's a vampire in torpor underneath. Maybe it's underneath the yacht club. Maybe it's in the water underneath the yacht club. Maybe it's buried in the sand underneath the pier at the yacht club. And someone's going to uh, exhume that sleeping vampire and uh, wake them up and unleash them on the city. Or maybe the secret is much more mundane. Maybe the yacht club is the territory that offers very desirable uh, hunting grounds for the player characters and they want it. Or perhaps an associate of theirs has some trouble with uh, neighboring factions and wants the player characters to defend the Yacht Club against an attack that they feel is coming. Or maybe something's being smuggled into the Yacht Club on a seemingly innocent looking boat and the characters are sent to re steal it. It becomes a heist scenario and that secret will also spawn consequences. Um, it can be daunting at first to operate this way, to build stories this way, but um, I want to assure any storytellers that might be new to Vampire that um, every time you do it, it gets easier. The practice of it, 
gets a little bit simpler each time, especially if you tell players, especially if you share the situation with players. And I know that sometimes seems like contrary wisdom. Uh, what I mean by that is um, I think there's a, there's a tradition in role-playing games that secrecy is paramount, that the storyteller should never really reveal what's going on or how their thought process works. And, uh, you know, sometimes that works, uh, especially if the players have been together for a while. But sometimes it doesn't work, uh, especially for new groups and new storytellers. And in those situations, I often, I always advise the, the storyteller to absolutely share what's in what's on their mind. Uh, and I often find those leading questions we talked about earlier to be very helpful. Hey, player at my table, I noticed that um, uh, one of your convictions on your sheet is that um, you know theft is always wrong, and yet this associate of yours has just offered an opportunity to um, get what you want if you will steal the item coming into the yacht club. How do you feel about that? Are you willing to cross that line that you said was important to you or are you not willing to do it? And what price are you willing to pay? Um, that conversation can spark story ideas. And I think it's, I think it's okay. I think it's fine. In fact, I think it's good for players to, um, share those moments with the storyteller and to build the story together. One of the, one of the most beautifully unique things about tabletop role playing is that it is collaborative. We share the story and we're all playing to find out what happens. And in those instances where things are stuck, just admitting that you're stuck and asking, what would you like to do next? Or what should we do next? Or does this story interest you? If I offer you this, will your character take it? That's okay. And I've had, uh, I've had some of the most memorable experiences in my storytelling life uh, just by being honest about the fact that I don't know what's going on next. Let's make something together. All right, I'm, uh, I'm going to check some notes that I made earlier here. Um, so speaking of notes, the oh, question did come up because, <laughs> you, you know, you talk about your decision trees and you talk about the location mm -hmm. notes and all these um, sure, and I want to stress method. that these are very sparse. They're, they, you still have to have them, and you still have to catalog them. Like, what are some tools mm -hmm. you use? Is it as simple as an online notepad, or is it a moleskin notebook that you carry mm -hmm. around? Oh, uh, I do carry a moleskin notebook. Uh, I try to have a, something to write with on me at all times because you never know when inspiration is going to strike. When you're when you're out on the street, when you're um, uh, watching television, um, you know, when you're at work, uh, sometimes a, an idea will will pop into your head because of something that you're doing or seeing, and you want to write it down. So I do write it down at the table at the at the during the game itself. Um, I don't use a notebook because I find that they're you know, they're not quick to reference and they can get um, uh, they can get a little difficult to manage. I just use uh, blank sheets of paper uh, every time I say, "Let me make a note." I'm writing a note on a fresh blank piece of paper and I try to have one piece of paper per note. I found, <laughs> I once uh, I once uh, made the mistake of trying to write everything on just a couple of pieces of paper and what I came away from the table with was uh, hieroglyphics that I couldn't decipher later. I really did what I had written down. That I had drawn arrows and circles and tried to connect things and um, yeah, that didn't work for me. Um, maybe because of my short-term memory, which is the way I think, I prefer to use a fresh sheet of paper uh, for each of my storytelling session or game. I have a lot of pieces, of each with an, in a separate idea on it, and sometimes go back and, and jot down notes. By night, I do keep, um, I do keep a, a document. I keep a Google Doc, uh, what I call the Master LA by Night document, and it's got Everything, each one of those individual pieces of paper that I've written uh, in every episode for every season gets. It is impossible to cross reference, but um, <laughs> somehow, somehow uh, it seems to work. Uh, other storytellers, um, they use, uh, there are all kinds of electronic note taking devices. One of the storytellers I, I admire very much uses a tablet with a stylus. Um, and a note-taking application at the at the table, and um, uh, her uh, her notes are really really impressive. They're just meticulous, and uh, I'm 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 in awe uh, of her ability to to do this on the fly because it just doesn't work for me. Uh, maybe I'm 
went to analog. I'm not. The, the storyteller's notes are, are very personal. Um, every storyteller finds their own unique method to remind themselves of what's going on. Um, for me, it's longhand notes with a pen or a pencil on a sheet of paper. For others, it's the tablet. And some seem to manage to keep all in their heads. How? I don't know. That's an impressive. That's an impressive feat. Memory is a certainly a gift, and some people have uh, the gift of a very prodigious memory and near total recall. But I, I, I can't do it. So, oh, any other uh, any other comments or questions about secrets and consequences before we move on to our our last secret? Um, a lot of people went to Boontown, uh, and they kind of wanted to know, like. How do you consider, like, when you're offering boons, like, you know, mm. what do you consider major? What do you consider minor? Um, how often do you well, hand them out? <laughs> yeah, it's funny because the way we talk about boons and vampire, it might lead a storyteller to believe, especially if they're experiencing vampire from for the first time, that there is um, some sign of universal exchange rate. For boons, right? Like the stock market. Yeah, you can have a major boon from uh, Prince Vanvar, but you got to take these three toxic boons from uh, uh, Baron Temple too with it. You know, bundled up, you know, or, or maybe it's more like uh, cryptocurrency, uh, you know, where you get these weird fluctuations in market. But that's actually closer to the truth, believe it or not. Boons are worth whatever the kindred who offered them can accomplish. So, you know, a boon from uh, a boon from Nelly G, the Baron of Hollywood, is worth a considerable amount if it's within Nelly's position uh, ability to fulfill it. If for some reason you know Nelly uh, is temporarily um, jeopardized in her barony, she might not be able to fulfill the boon, and the boon could become worth a little less, or maybe it becomes worth more, decreases her power and her influence in her holding. Uh, characters who have nothing to offer in terms of holdings uh, and have only their own wits, their, their hands, you know, sometimes their boons aren't worth as much, or maybe they're worth a lot to the right kindred because they're capable of something special that few kindred can do. But to answer the question a little bit more specifically, generally um, the, the life boon or the unlife boon is for saving the life of another kindred. And sometimes that is equal to the unlife or the final death. The major boon, normally, most for most kindred, that is given when someone has gone to significant trouble and risk for your benefit. They have exposed themselves to danger. They have risked the masquerade. They have sacrificed something important to them, and they expect you to do the same in return. You know, the trivial boon is a minor favor, uh, an introduction to somebody that you couldn't otherwise meet. Uh, the loan of a use your limo for the, the weekend. That's a, that might be a trivial or minor boon. Um, but again, the value fluctuates and the value that um, an individual kindred places on a boon is very personal. Sometimes a boon from the prince isn't worth as much as it seems, especially if the prince is a known boon breaker. Vampires who have the reputation for not fulfilling their boons you know, they don't get very far in, in kindred society, even among the Anarchs, which don't recognize a lot of formalized uh, rules or the, the necessarily the six stands them. Even they are hesitant to not honor their favors and pledges and promises. Uh, the kindred whose you know, word is worth nothing often finds themselves alone and isolated. You can build an entire chronicle on the... Uh, the intricate web of favors that are owned because in some cities, boons are fungible. They can be traded, bought, and sold, like on the stock market. Sure, I'm holding a boon from uh, the, you know, the sheriff or uh, maybe just from my buddy over here, but I don't need it. I'll sell it to you in exchange for something that I want. And suddenly, the character who owns the boon has to fulfill it for someone they detest or maybe someone they love. It changes the whole dynamic of the situation. Excellent. And I like that NFTs have now educated us all to actually know what the word fungible actually means. 
Uh, I have. I really love the idea of the boon stock market. Someday, I think that could be a great scenario. It sounds like a very, very New York City thing to do. Right? Absolutely, absolutely. What, what's a what's a boon from the Prince of Boston going for these days? Well, it looks like it's going for you know three majors and a minor. Okay. You know, next thing you know, they're going to be making uh, you know Moneyball movies out of it. So, I'm okay with that. Yep. Um, so, let's see where we're headed. Um, so one of the questions was uh, that I thought was pretty interesting was how do you deal with a mixed coterie, um, especially when it comes to like age and neonates, uh, specifically this person. Ooh, is. In, intriguing, intriguing. Um, with the, uh, remember, I talked about session zero earlier. If um, if the storyteller has decided that a mixed coterie of, of wildly differing ages is okay, that's something that really needs to be discussed, I think, with the players and the storyteller together, because it's going to create disparities, right? The, uh, the character that is, um, uh, is older probably has a lower blood potency, which makes them more feats. And they may have knowledge or information or other advantages that um, younger kindred do not have. Uh, the disparities between the characters can create um, tensions at the table between players if they're not discussed. Sometimes, though, those are great stories. Uh, and often um, discussion at session zero leads to the narrative opportunity that you're looking for. Um, let's, for example, let's say that the, there are four players at the table. Three of them are neonates and one uh, is playing an Ancilla. That happens sometimes, and uh, if the storyteller is okay with that, discuss it with the players and figure out how does this play into our story. Maybe the three younger characters um, are related to the older character, or um, maybe the older character is them a boon to maybe balance out the situation a little bit. Maybe the younger characters have gone to great trouble to do something uh, beneficial to the uh, Ancilla, and now the Ancilla owes them a favor. Um, and that can create um, uh, that can create a situation in which everybody feels they're getting something equally valuable out of the experience. Excellent, excellent. Um, we got about like you know like twelve minutes or so left, and I think this is all right. I think your all your right. final bullet here is the perfect way to bring yeah. us home. All right, we're going to talk really briefly about this last story, seal our secret, and if we have any time left, I'll I'll field. You know questions about anything uh, related to tonight's discussion that that uh, the chat may have. The final storyteller secret is that it's okay to give players what they want, sort of. Now, throughout this discussion tonight, it might seem like I'm suggesting that you should be a kind and benevolent storyteller, and that you should always give players exactly what they want all the time, uh, to a degree. That's exactly what I'm saying. I think as storytellers, we should be fans of the characters in our chronicle. We uh, want the players to get what they want from the game experience. And we want our players to be happy so that they'll continue playing, of course, but also just because we like it when, you know, when our friends are happy. Uh, and sometimes this means that the characters should also get what they want. But uh, as anyone who's ever watched any of the stories uh, in Vampire that I tell, you already know you can get what you said you wanted and still not be happy. Because getting what you want in Vampire almost always involves those secrets and consequences that I talked about, those difficult choices um, that we discussed earlier. You know, the character who wants a better feeding tory, territory, maybe they do get it. But maybe it carries with them, maybe it carries a burden um, that they didn't expect. And now they have a whole series of inconvenient choices they have to make. They got what they wanted, but it isn't precisely what they thought. Now, I'm not suggesting that we should, um, you know, that we should always strive to make characters' lives miserable. That's not what I'm saying, especially if it makes the players unhappy. Uh, what I'm saying is that we should strive to... Um, present the world of darkness in a way that it challenges the characters so that um, when they do get what they want, it isn't the end of the story. You wanted that feeding territory? Now you got it. 
Okay, well, that's not very exciting, is it? That didn't create any drama. There was no opportunity for action there. There was no invitation to a choice, no secret, no consequence. We play, as I mentioned, to find out what happens. And giving a character what they wanted in such a way that uh, creates more story is uh, generally the way to go, I think. Again, it depends on what you prefer at your particular table. Um, you know, specific advice on how to make this happen. Uh, one of the storyteller secrets that, uh, that I appreciate uh, was given to me a long time ago, um, and that is get feedback from your players about what their characters want and think after each game. Spend some time once the, uh, once the evening session is over talking about it. Hey, did that work? What did you think about this scene? Did that work for you? Uh, I see that uh, I see that your character made some uh, made some progress toward um, her goal. Once she gets it, how is she going to feel? Uh, is the story going the way you thought? Um, do you want to change your mind? You know, are your convictions working for you? Um, these conversations I find um, help the storyteller decide whether or not um, the character getting what they want is going to go the way. Um, not necessarily that they wanted, but to create those additional opportunities uh, for action. Uh, I think it's always, um, I think it's good to get feedback on the storytelling too. Do you like the way we presented the scene? Was the pacing good? Um, you know, is there anything that I can do better? Uh, is there anything you'd like uh, me to do more of or less of? How do we help each other have the best time possible uh, at the table? Another way to do it is, um, I think, to check in with each other, both during the game and after the game. It's perfectly okay to stop the action and say, all right, is this going the way you thought? Um, uh, are you doing okay? Remember we talked about considerate play earlier and safety tools. Um, that works for story too. It's okay to ask the, story, the players for story suggestions. It's uh, take a pause, uh, grab a drink of water, remember to drink water and um, check in with each other and talk about where the characters are going and uh, what they want to get out of it. That may seem counterintuitive because isn't this supposed to be a, you know, a grand narrative that's, you know, uh, unrolled uh, for the players to enjoy? Well, remember we talked about the fact that vampire is a narrative first collaborative experience and often the best vampire stories happen when the players have real-time input at the table about what their characters are doing. Uh, if your players aren't enjoying it, they'll let you know. And if they are, they'll let you know too. Um, when in doubt, like I said, to reiterate, narrate the situation, then adjudicate it, and then transition on to the next scene. The, the desires of characters to get what they want can take a long time. Characters who are vampires are on living beings who can live an unimaginably long time. And that's hard to model at the table where each individual game session may represent only a night or two. It's hard to think long term. So some characters have desires and goals, things that they want that can't be resolved in a single night. And there's a, um, there's a great tool in Vampire in the core rulebook um, called Projects. And uh, the project system is an optional rule system, but it sets up a way for characters to basically embark on a grand scheme with many moving parts. And it gives the storyteller tools to figure out how to let the character make progress on these projects, not while the game is in session, but between the games in the in what we call the downtime. Uh, maybe the characters, like we talked about, want a better feeding territory. There are some things they can do during the game session to achieve that. Uh, some physical actions that they can take and some choices that they can make. But some of the things they might want to do to get a better feeding territory aren't necessarily things that can be represented in a single night of play. Maybe they have to invest in businesses. Maybe they have to um, uh, help people in the neighborhood find a better way of life. Or maybe they have to get rid of um, uh, condemned buildings or dangerous, uh, dangerous roads. Those are better represented as downtime projects that the characters make progress on off screen or off stage and that when complete or when they hit a certain milestone generate those uh, opportunities for action 
uh, at the table. Okay, you've been working on improving your feeding territory for you know two months now, but you've hit a snag. You just can't seem to um, deal with uh, the, this terrible uh, set of roads. The, the construction companies don't want to fix them. You can't get anywhere um, using the normal mortal apparatus. How do you want to challenge that? Or maybe it results in a storyteller character with a big secret about the neighborhood having their attention attracted by the actions of this project and deciding it's time to deal with these player character upstarts once and for all. So it's okay to give players what they want, sort of. Gotta, gotta have that little asterisk there. Absolutely. Um, we don't have much time left, I think. We don't, and uh, I've been saving this one. Uh, and you Oh, know, great. I can hardly wait. Well, first off, thank you. You've, you've been amazing um everybody in the chat has just been gushing at how much information they're getting from this uh if this is certainly going to come back on youtube um we'll post it either on ours cool. or on world of darkness at some point in the future this is not going to go away this is this is gold we're going to keep this all right uh, and i'm vain enough to want to be seen as often as possible so i don't know about you but i don't get the chance to work with superstars every day um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, you caught me off guard. That that would be that would be nice, right? But right? Uh, exactly. I think I think people might be surprised at how much how much that is not something uh, that I want. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, but basically, this one was you as a seasoned storyteller. Uh, when do you mm. take the time to actually play as a player? And uh, if you do, what's your favorite clan? I think that's kind of a good way to end this, so what? you can. What's my favorite what? Clan to play as well. Well, that part of the question is easy, right? Let me just say this about that. <laughs> uh, my favorite clan has always been the Ventru. Uh, I love all the clans, and I, I, I have, there's something to love about each and every clan in Vampire, and I don't think I would hesitate to play any of them. I played most of them, I think. Maybe not all. I don't think I've ever played a Malkavian. Um except as a, a storyteller character. But my favorite has always been the Ventru. Their story of... Um, flawed leadership of uh, of noblesse oblige gone bad, and that uh, the shouldering uh, shouldering a burden that nobody else wants, and yet you know they're resented for doing it. Uh, that story has always fascinated me because it's a very human story, like all vampire stories are. And uh, I've always gravitated towards stories of um, you know fallen nobility and hubris gone bad. I'm I'm always scared of pride. I think it might be one of the things I fear the most. And the story of the venture is, you know, of, of, of pride gone bad, of, of uh, pridefulness soured to the point where it creates terrible problems. I've always found that intriguing. But when do I get to play? Not too often. Uh, but uh, when I do, it's always very, very special. I think, um, is this the part where I say thank you? Yeah, this is. Is, this is where we wrap up. And... Uh... We'll, we'll head on out of here and uh, give a little breathing room to to the new show and the new people. I'm, oh, I'm I can't excited. Wait. This is going to be great. <laughs> Miami nightlife. I'm How cool is that? Excited. Very excited. Well, then let me just say very quickly then, thank you, uh, family, for being here with us tonight. Uh, it was an honor uh, to have this discussion with you. I hope we get to do it again uh, sometime in the not too distant future. Um, tomorrow night, I'll be hosting a very different kind of stream in which we talk about uh, LA by night season five with you. And I want to thank one more time, uh, Renegade Game Studios for allowing me the time to have this discussion with you. Thanks very much and good night.